Welcome to a live Action for Happiness event. I'm Mark Williamson. It's fantastic to see thousands of you joining us for this uh, conversation today. And I'm really, really delighted to be welcoming our guest today, Rangan Chatterjee. Rangan, it's really great to be with you again. Thank you so much for, for making time for this. Mark, thank you very much for having me. I've been really, really excited about this. So yeah, really, really looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. Well, I want to make the best use of your precious time uh, with this community. Uh, so very briefly, folks, we're going to have a, a conversation together about uh, Rongren's great book, Happy Mind, Happy Life, the theme for this event, and so much more, actually, about uh, the way we can respond to these messages and make them practical. So you'll have a chance to get involved and also to ask Rangan some questions in the Q&A uh, part of the event later on. So thank you for being here. Let's keep the conversation in the chat, kind, relevant and supportive as it always is. But without further ado, Rangan, I wanted to start actually before we um, sort of lean a little bit into your background is just to do something together that we do at lots of our Action of Happiness gatherings, meetings, events and so on. And we call it the check-in. And what we do is take a pause, we each share something we're feeling right now and something we're grateful for just really quickly. So wherever you are right now, and it's lovely to see you welcoming each other from all around the world, let's all do this together. Let's all just take five or 10 seconds just to take a little mindful pause and tune into what's going for us right now. Okay, great. I, uh, I needed that pause. I'm feeling a little bit rushed personally. I've had quite a busy day and I've also, we've been dealing with COVID back in our house recently. So it's been a bit of a challenge for the family, but I'm also really grateful for this chance to reconnect with Rangan. Haven't seen uh, you since we were together in London, maybe five years ago now, and it's been a joy to watch your journey. So feeling very grateful for this time together. How about you, Rangan? How are you feeling? Yeah, as I close my eyes there and tuned in, if I'm Totally honest, I'm feeling a little bit emotionally fragile at the moment. Uh, and that's because uh, my elderly mum, who I help uh, to care for, she's not doing so great. She's had a few falls over the last few days. So that's going on in the background. So that's just me being honest. That's obviously going to have an influence on my current state. Um, but I'm feeling incredibly grateful to connect with you, Mark, to have this conversation. And since I've been on, just seeing all these gorgeous messages in the chat, people greeting from all over the world, being kind to each other, really, really nice to see. So um, yeah, looking forward to our chat, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm sending best wishes for your mum and, and for you and all the family. And thank you folks for sharing in the chat what you're feeling, many of which you know are dealing with difficult times right now as well, but also choosing to notice what we're grateful for. Um, these are all things that come up in your, your fantastic book, Rangan, you know, about the importance of our inner life and our happiness, um, at, but also the kind of ability to, to you know, focus on what's not going well, because that's an important part of living a happy life as well. Um, but before we talk about the book, uh, you, know, you don't really need any introduction in terms of a very high profile medical expert, written some fantastic work, you know, got one of the world's most successful podcasts, hugely high profile. But I guess my first question is, why would a medical doctor and GP like you want to write a book on happiness? Yeah, it's a good question, Mark. It's not the usual thing, is it? A medical doctor writing a book on happiness. Well, the reason I decided to write this book is because for my entire career, I've been focused on what is the root cause of why this patient has come in to see me? I've always been fascinated by that. Not necessarily what's the symptom. Yes, that's, of course, very interesting and very relevant, because that's often what's brought someone in. But for me, it's always been about what's been going on in this person's life for the past week, the past few months, maybe the past few years, that means on this particular day, they've rocked up in my surgery looking for help. And for many years, Mark, I've said in public, and there's good research and evidence to support this, that 80 to 90% of what we as medical doctors see in any given day, is in some way related to our collective modern lifestyles. Now, I want to be clear, Mark, when I say that, that's not about putting blame on people. People are not doing this to themselves. Modern life for many of us is really, really tough. And a lot of people struggle to make the decisions and engage in the behaviors 
that they know are going to help them, but they, they find it really, really tough, right? So I'm not putting blame on people, but nonetheless, that is at the root cause of all kinds of problems that I see. And I've written books on this, you know, I've been talking about, you know, when we make small changes to four key areas, food, movement, sleep, relaxation, we can have profound changes in all aspects of our health, anxiety, depression, uh, migraines, stress-related symptoms, gut problems, obesity, type 2 diabetes, all kinds of things can be hugely influenced by changes in our lifestyle. But for the last few years, Mark, something's been niggling away at me in the back of my mind. Is it really lifestyle that's the upstream driver of these conditions? Or could there be something that's even more upstream? Right. And I, I reviewed, you know, I've been almost 21 years now as a medical doctor in, in about four weeks time. It's 21 years of practice. Um, and I looked back at all these patients who really transformed their lives, not just for four weeks felt good, but really, really made a significant change. I looked into the research and it's very, very clear to me there is something that's even more important than our lifestyle. And that's happiness. That's our mental well-being. That's how we think about the world, right? People who are happy in their lives and with their lives are healthier, right? The research shows that over and over again. Now, Mark, I think it's really interesting. Why would that be? Well, I think the first reason, I think people intuitively understand when it's explained. People who feel pretty content, who feel pretty happy with the state of their lives are less likely to engage in a lot of poor lifestyle behaviors, right? They're less likely to comfort eat as much. They're less likely to need to drown their sorrows in half a bottle of wine or a whole bottle of wine every evening. I'm not criticizing people for those behaviors, just to be clear. I'm just saying if you feel happier and content, you are less likely to do that. So that's reason number one. But actually, there's a second broad category of reasons here, which has nothing to do with that. And the best example of this is a study of nuns. And this may have come up in one of your previous um, webinars. I'm not sure if it has or not, but this is a beautiful study where they followed nuns for the entirety of their lives, Mark. And all of these nuns had the same lifestyle, the same diet, the same sleep, the same stress, all kinds of things, right? The lifestyle is the same, yet even with the same lifestyle, the positive, the happy, the contented nuns earlier on in the life lived longer and they were significantly healthier, right? So happiness, you know, you mentioned a viral infection that, you know, you mentioned COVID, you mentioned what your family is struggling with at the moment. Another study mark has shown, right, that the state of your uh, inner world will influence when you're exposed to a virus, whether you get sick or not, right? This was done recently. Researchers took groups of people into a lab. They all got uh, rhinovirus inserted up their nose. Now, it doesn't sound like a pleasant experiment, but rhinovirus is the bug that causes the common, gold, uh, the common cold, right? Now, what was really interesting, they all got exposed to rhinovirus, but actually they could clearly see the not so positive mood category. Okay, so that's a polite way of I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to say the unhappy uh, group were three times more likely to get infected with that cold than the group who were happy and content. Right? Oh, so let's just think story. about that. That's yeah. incredible. That basically is saying our you, you, action for happiness, what you are all trying to promote. Yes, it's about feeling good, content, happy with the state of your life. It also has a profound impact on your physical health. And coming back to your first question, that is why I felt compelled to write this book as a medical doctor, because happiness is linked to health. We're not talking about it as doctors. We're not talking about it in society. So my effort with this book is to put that idea on the map for people so they can start drawing that link. I, um, I feel moved right now just to take a pause and thank you for the work you're doing, actually, Rangan. I'm, I'm sure we'll do this a bit more later, but actually not just on behalf of the audience. Um, I'm already seeing lots of love in the chat, but actually personally, you know, I've been working in this world for 12 plus years now. And I've read lots of books, as you can imagine, listened to thousands of podcasts and so on. And actually, your work has been a real inspiration because you've been able to link what you just talked about, the kind of very real world of the medical health community with 
this experiential world we all have on the, in our inner lives and in our state of mind and how unbelievably interrelated these things are. So lots of thanks to you for Thank you. being the GP out there making this point, actually. Um, in your book, Happy Mind, Happy Life, you talk about a three-legged stool, that there were kind of three components for what I think you call core happiness. So I wondered if you could tell us what core happiness is, and then maybe we could talk about what those three components of it might be. Yeah, Mark, so the first thing to say is, if I was going to raise awareness um, of this, I didn't wanna just raise awareness of a problem and say, oh, there it is, there's a link. No, for me, everything I do is always about, can I make this practical? Can I make this relevant for each and every single person so they feel they can actually do something about it? So when I was writing the book, I thought I've got to come up with a practical model that every single person is going to genuinely find useful in their life. And it, it took me a long time to come up with this three-legged stool concept because I was trying to come up with something that holds true for every single person in every single situation. And the model is very simple. The core happiness, I should say what core happiness is. Core happiness is, I think, the happiness that everyone truly wants. Every human being really, really wants in their life. Because happiness potentially has been getting a bit of a bad rap in some places on the internet. I don't know if you've experienced this or not, Mark, but it's almost become trendy to say it's not about happiness, it's about meaning, it's about fulfillment. And hey, listen, I'm not against meaning, I'm not against fulfillment, but I don't think they're quite the same things as happiness. I think we sh those things are necessary ingredients for a happy life, but they're not happiness in and of themselves. And so core happiness is my attempt to break down the components of happiness in a very practical way. So I want people to think of this core happiness stool as having three legs, right? Each of these legs is separate, but essential. If any one of those legs starts to weaken and collapse, your feelings of happiness will also start to weaken and then collapse. So what are these three legs? Alignment, contentment, and control. Right, so what do I mean? First, like alignment. This is basically saying when the person who you really are inside and the person who you are being there out there in the world are one and the same. Okay, that's alignment. When your inner values and your external actions start to match up more and more. So that's very, very important. The second leg is contentment. What are those things that you can do in your life that give you that sense of peace, that feeling of calm, that feeling of contentment. That's how you work on the contentment leg of the stool. And the third leg is very, very important, particularly at the moment, right? The third leg is control. Now, control is a word that can, again, be misinterpreted. I'm not talking about controlling the world or controlling external events. I think the actions, Mark, of the last few years have shown us we cannot control the world is going to do what the world is going to do, right? This is about what can you do each day that gives you a sense of control over the world? Because we know from the research, people with a sense of control have higher motivation. They have higher willpower. They have more academic success. They earn more money, right? They, um, they're happy. They live longer. So the sense of control is, a, is another very important component. So these are the three legs, and I've designed this in a way so that people can strengthen and work on those things, because here's the key message in, my, uh, in this book and, and the wider sort of public messaging around this book, Mark, is that happiness is a skill. Happiness is a skill that you can practice, you can develop, you can get better at. A lot of people think happiness is something I'm just going to stumble across one day when everyone treats me well, when my email inbox is clear. No, happiness is an inside job. You can cultivate happiness. You can work on happiness once you know what to work on. And basically, that's what the whole book is about. It's about saying, these are the three legs. These are simple things that don't cost any money at all. Nothing that I've written about in this book costs anyone any money at all, Mark, to do, which is very, very important to me as a doctor. And anyone can work on. So ultimately, whoever you are, no matter where you are in your life, if you start using that model, oh, this helps me feel content. That's why I feel happier afterwards. Or, oh, actually, you know what? I'll tell you, this came up with a patient, Mark. 
right? Alignment, right? Someone asked in the chat, you know, can you repeat your definition of alignment? Alignment is when the person who you really are inside and the person who you are actually being out there in the world are one and the same, right? Now, one of my patients once, she was struggling with a few things. And actually something that came up is that she had been a bit dishonest at work a couple of years back. She had basically downplayed what a colleague had done and elevated what she had done to get a promotion, right? She got the promotion. She got more money. It all felt good. But here's the thing. We cannot hide from ourselves. So in that moment at night, in those, you know, she's trying to get to sleep. She had insomnia. She had anxiety. And a big part of it actually, Mark, was that she had acted out of alignment with who she was. On the surface, that looked good, but it was corroding at the inside of her like an acid. She knew it wasn't the person who she really was, right? That's such a good so, example. Yeah, yeah, so that's just a way to think about it. The more aligned we become in our lives, even, well, even what we did right at the start there, sharing something, being vulnerable, mm -hmm. actually being honest, of course, not every setting is appropriate for that. And people have to be very careful, I think, where they're sharing, where they're taking their masks off. But that felt really great, you know, to actually not try and pretend that everything's great in my life at the moment when it isn't. And actually honestly say, hey, listen, I'm going to have a great conversation with you, I hope. Um, but this is the truth of what's going on in the background in my mind. So hopefully that's clear for people. I, I love that. And I, in the book, you talk about maskless conversations or the people you want to take your mask off with I would love to come on to that because I think it's so important but before we dive more I mean first of all just to recap you talked about alignment contentment and control and some people have really helpfully defined that further in in the chat um Rangan, I know you've got some fantastic exercises in the book and people who've joined action for happiness events before know we like to make this interactive um, I wondered if we could start with one of your simple reflections about some of the things we do in our daily lives and perhaps some of the things we want to do throughout our lives could you maybe take us through a little way of doing this together? Yeah, look, there's plenty of simple exercises in the book, but this one I particularly love. And I think it speaks a little bit to alignment. It also speaks to this why do idea, which I suspect this audience are already familiar with, this idea that many people these days are confusing happiness and success. They think it's the same thing. And for most of us, for, for many of us, Mark, I should say, it really isn't. This is why so many people these days are chasing more money, a better car, nicer holiday, a nicer phone, whatever it might be. And actually, a lot of people end up getting their version of that and still find there's a big hole in their heart inside that that success, that material uh, possession and acquisition didn't fill, right? I have been there before, Mark, relatively recently as well, right? So this is not me looking down on that. I got seduced by that idea as well. And so a very simple way that we can start to think about this ourselves, I really would encourage everyone to do this now is, and Mark, maybe perhaps you can do it along with us all at the same time, which is think about three things that you could do this week that if you did them regularly would truly give you that sense of happiness and contentment. That's a great question. And I will reflect on that personally, as you've suggested, but also invite everyone in the community to share three or indeed one, if that's all that comes to mind of the things that you can do uh, this week that will bring you a sense of happiness and contentment. So feel free to share that uh, in the chat if you'd like to. I'm, I'm seeing a few coming up, take a walk, read a good book, get outside more, good bedtime routine, time with family, a bath, uh, write down good things, go to the gym, uh, sing, play, breathe, connect with a yeah. friend, yoga, uh, put my laptop away, go to the cinema, swim in the sea, run, be in nature, be in the moment, volunteer, be near water, play with my toddlers, cuddle my dog, not be so hard on myself. I'm not sure yeah. I need to share my own one. I mean, my own ones are, are many of those things. For me, it would be family time, cycling, a um, bit of meditation practice. Uh, how are you feeling seeing that list fly past, Rangan? Yeah, it's lovely. I mean, it's, it's lovely to see uh, all these things. And you know what's really interesting, Mark, as I look through what everyone's writing, there's a similar theme, which it's, it's the simple things, mm. right? It's, it's walking, it's being with people we like, it's doing things for others, it's 
that there's very similar themes there. So, okay, so just pause for a minute. Okay, so everyone's had a lot of think about that, right? Then the second part of this exercise is called write your own happy ending, right? So now what I, I'd love everyone to do is fast forward to the end of your life and imagine you're on your deathbed. Looking back on your life, what are three things you will want to have done? And again, if it's just one thing, that's fine as well. But just when you reflect back on your life, what are three things you will want to have done or achieved? What might those things be? What comes to mind immediately for me is be a kind person, spend time with people I care about, spend time on things that really mean a lot to me. Let me see what others are writing as well. Having laughed, having been kind, made a difference in the world, fostered friendship, leave a legacy, give love, travel, uh, happiness, uh, make a difference, uh, laugh, um, plant trees, um, be sure that people I love know that I love them, being authentic. Um, they're actually flying past so fast I can't read them now. Have babies, be a light in the world, leave a mark on the world, be available to my granddaughter, yeah. meditate, connect with people, not have any regrets. They're, they're similar, but they're, what, what they're do you similar. see the difference here? Yeah. Yeah. So, what's really interesting for me is that if if anyone has, you know, thank you for everyone to, for sharing your, your responses. But if you've done that exercise, and if you have taken a bit of time to write it down yourself, then what you do is bring those two sets of answers together. Mm. And you ask yourself, if I do these three happiness habits, week after week, will I get that happy ending that I just defined that I want? And why this is deceptively simple at you know, this exercise really is so, so powerful. It's deceptively simple because a lot of people, and if we had, you know, maybe there's not time to go into this case study, but a lot of people will say on their deathbeds, you know, I hope I'm nourished. Uh, my, my relationship spent time with my friends and family. Yeah. On a week to week basis, they're like, oh man, I'm working so hard. I've got so many commitments. I'm doing so many other things that I don't have time to see my partner or my children or my friends or whatever that might be. So this is not an exercise to beat ourselves up. In fact, there's a whole chapter in the book on self-compassion. That's not going to help us if we're being really hard to ourselves. This is a ex simple exercise that brings intention to our lives. It's like, oh, yeah, I know friends and family are going to be important to me, but actually um, I don't have any time to see them. And it maybe you can't change it all straight away, but even doing that exercise will start to change your behavior very subtly. You may not be able to change everything at once, but once you start doing simple exercises like this, you can start to make simple changes. And Mark, here's the truth, right? We kind of know what pretty much all of us are gonna say in our deathbed. How do we know that? Palliative care nurses tell us over and over again, people say the same things. You know, uh, Bronnie Care, what does she say in her book, Five Regrets of the Dying, right? Uh, people say, I wish I'd worked less. I wish I spent more time with friends and family. I wish I'd allowed myself to be happy, which I find that sort of wording very difficult. And then here's one, right, which I think really speaks to alignment and what we've been talking about. I wish I'd lived my life and not the life that other people expected of me. Mark, I actually, maybe it's a reflection of my current emotional state, but I feel really teary as I say that, because that's what I see in many of my patients. That's what I see in many of my friends. Frankly, that's what I've, I've done for much of my life. I've lived someone else's life. In fact, for me, I needed my dad to die nine and a half years ago to really start asking myself these big existential questions. And now for me, honestly, like that has led to me now. Um, living a truly aligned life these days. Like it's been hard work shifting things, right? I've had to unpeel a lot of layers and it's been a journey. I didn't do it overnight, but I'm now, you know, nine and a half years now on since dad died. I kind of feel about as happy and content as I've ever been. And honestly, Mark, it has very, very little to do with that external success. And I know that sounds rich coming from me, right? I get that because people will say, well, it's all right for you. You have ticked off these metrics of societal success and you're right, you know what I have. But for much of the time when I was ticking off those boxes, I wasn't truly happy. 
Like I really wasn't. Yes, I was, you know, having a successful book, successful podcast, TV series, right? I was helping people. But was I truly happy at the same time? No, I was on that journey to find happiness and contentment. And a lot of the things that I've learned in my own life and I've learned from research and from my patients, I've literally shared in this book. I've never been more vulnerable, Mark, in any of my books. I've shared stuff like I, people may, if they listen to my podcast, they may have heard me say this, but my wife will never read any of my books whilst I'm writing them. She goes, no, I'll let's read it right at the end. So when, it, when it's finished, when it's gone through all the copy edits, she will take a final look. She's amazing. She will always make some brilliant, insightful comments, things that I haven't maybe thought about or missed, right? And this book, when she was doing this last summer, she said, hey, wrong and listen, are you sure you want to put some of this in the book? I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, you, you sure you want to share this? You sure you want to share that you used to hit yourself in the face when you were losing at pool when you're at uni? And I, she was trying to protect me, right? She said, are you sure you want people knowing this? I said, you know, babe, honestly, I feel okay with it. Like we're all imperfect humans doing the best that we can. And when we try and put on these masks and pretend we're something other than that, we, we don't give people an invitation to also be able to open up themselves. And so for me, it's been really liberating. Would I have done it four years ago? No way. I was scared of being judged. What will people think of me? But now it's like, no. And I hope this inspires more people to do that in appropriate settings, of course. So sorry, I went off on a bit of a tangent there. No, I, but... I'm really moved by that, Rangan, and, I'm, and I wanted to let you tell that story because I think it's a fantastic example of that vulnerability, authenticity. And I, yeah, I think in, you're talking about waking up and many people in this community are on a journey towards a, a more enlightened way of living. But actually, sometimes it takes a crisis. You talked about your dad dying. For me, I had a severe sort of health back pain crisis that got me out of corporate life and into doing this. And I remember doing an exercise, which, is, which remind, I was reminded of with your fantastic uh, interactive thing there so we were asked to think about the things that really matter in our life and I remember writing down our family and purpose and uh, all this stuff and then it was now imagine a private detective has been following you around for the last month what would they conclude are the priorities in your life and at the time it was like oh well they probably think I cared about my salary and my image and my reputation and gosh this is like in congress they're out of sync and I think what you just helped remind us of is the this back to your alignment point it's not so much about putting on the show we want to put on for the world and more about tuning into what's in our hearts really so yeah mark can i can just say on that point i think this is a very individual what, I, what that core happiness tool we can all apply it to ourselves right all of us can have different preferences we're going to have different desires we're going to have different family backgrounds different cultures that's okay i don't think there's one route to happiness one thing i will say for all of us happiness really is an inside job it's not found out there, even though society will try and tell us and teach us that it is out there. The way we frame things, the way we think about ourselves, so much of it is under our control. It really is. I get that. And I, I say that with great sensitivity. I know there's a lot of heartache in the world. I know there's a lot of struggle. And I can share more on that if you no, want. I, but... I really love this theme because it reminds me of one of your most moving podcast conversations with Edith Eager, um, the Holocaust survivor. And, and in oh, fact, wow. both she and indeed Viktor Frankl, who wrote, again, as a Holocaust survivor, make this point that I think you're making that we can't control what happens to us. But to some extent, at least we can choose our response, even in the most horrific of circumstances. And I found that conversation you had incredibly moving and... Maybe that's one of the fundamental messages of your book, actually, that it, we can't choose what happens, but we can choose what we do. Is that right? A hundred percent. That that conversation I had with Edith Eager is probably the most powerful conversation I've ever had, not just on my podcast, right? In my life, full stop. Mm. Two hours with this incredible 93-year-old lady, you know, and you mentioned Victor Frankl. There's a quote there at the back of my podcast studio that my daughter has written out for me. One of my favorite bits of Frankel quotes about, you know, between stimulus and response is a, is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And, you know, basically in that space is what's, I'm, I'm totally butchering the quote now. So I apologize for that. But it's basically about our ability to choose there. That gives us our freedom. 
And chapter five in the book is called Seek Out Friction. It's my favorite chapter in the book because it's the one I use every day and it's had the biggest impacts on my own health and happiness. And it's how in every single situation, pretty much in life, we have an opportunity to choose what I call a happiness story, right? So a lot of us take a disempowering narrative, right? So let's say, let's make it really simple. Our boss sends us an email at 3 p.m. and we don't like the tone of it, right? So what happens, Mark, is this, and or, or a version of this. Oh man, I cannot believe my boss sent me that. Does my boss not know? I know how to do my job. I worked last weekend. You know, they're taking me for granted. What, you know, fill in the blank, whatever disempowering narrative you want to take. Now, why is that a problem? Well, the reason it's a problem for our happiness and health is that by doing that, we are creating emotional stress. Now, that emotional stress has to be neutralized in some way, usually with what I call in the book, junk happiness habits. We've all got junk happiness habits, sugar, um, scrolling on Instagram, drinking too much alcohol, gambling, these days, online pornography, all kinds of things or junk happiness habits are there to fill that gap, basically. And what I'm trying to say is that that emotional stress is real. Now, in that situation, if you can learn the skill of reframing, you take the emotional sting out of it. It doesn't mean you have to put up with bad behavior, but you can reframe that and choose what I call a happiness story. Perhaps my boss is having relationship problems at the moment and they're taking it out on me. Perhaps my boss, one of their children was up last night with earache and they're knackered. Perhaps my boss is under pressure from their boss. It doesn't matter. And here's a very controversial thing, Mark, that I really, I think it's worth exploring. For your happiness, often the truth of the situation doesn't actually matter, right? Now, this is, I know that gets a lot of people's backs up. And let me explain what I mean, right? The best way I can explain this, yeah, someone put that assume good intent. Exactly, right? Exactly. Now, let's imagine a, a romantic couple right? Who are having a conversation, a heated conversation, they're having a disagreement. I'm almost certain that everyone who's watching this knows what that feels like. If you don't, try and imagine what it might feel like, okay? So a couple having a disagreement, what happened? What was the truth? Well, it kind of depends who you ask, Mark, doesn't it? If you ask one party, they'll give you a report about what just happened. Walk around to the other side of the situation Ask the other person, they'll give you a completely different report of the same situation, right? Football fans, psychologists did the study on football fans, right? They showed two sets of football fans the same incident. What happened? They asked them. Both sets of fans reported seeing different things. So what does that teach us? It teaches us that every situation has multiple perspectives, and we can train ourselves to take the happiness perspective. Now, you mentioned Edith Eager, right? And some people may go, okay, with the, with the email from my boss, I get it. I can do that. But there are some situations in life where I simply can't do that. I often find that. I think, yeah, this one's tricky. And then I think back to Edith Eager. So Edith Eager, when she was 16, right? Growing up in Eastern Europe, they got a knock on the door. They got put, her, her sister and her two parents got put on a train to Auschwitz concentration camp. Within two hours of getting there, both of her parents were murdered, right? Later on that day, Mark, she was asked to dance for the senior prison guards. Now, the first thing she said to me, which I, I distinctly remember, Mark, was this. When I was dancing, I wasn't dancing in Auschwitz because I never forgot the last thing that my mother said to me, which was, Edie, nobody can ever take from you the contents that you put inside your own mind. So she said, I wasn't dancing in Auschwitz. In my mind, I was in Budapest Opera House. I had a beautiful dress on. There was a full house. There was an orchestra playing. And I thought, oh my God, that's incredible. Okay. Then she said, Mark, while she was in Auschwitz, she started to see the prison guards as the prisoners. Right? She said, I could see they weren't free. They weren't living the life that they wanted to live. In my mind, I was free. Now I was thinking, okay, this is just incredible. I cannot imagine that. 
And then Mark, the final thing she said to me, and these words are literally etched into my soul and I think about them every day. She said, Rongen, I have lived in Auschwitz and I can tell you this, the greatest prison you will ever live inside is the prison you create inside your own mind. And Mark, that's what so many of us do each day, right? Let's talk about happiness for a minute. We are creating mental stories that often are not true about the world around us. That person did this to me. If only this change, I would feel better. Well, I get it. I get a lot of us have got challenging lives, but we have a choice. And whenever I struggle, and chapter five, honestly, has so many practical ways on how you can learn to reframe situations. It will help you deal with criticism better. It will help you deal with judgment better. All these things, right? And if I'd practice this every day, I look for one moment of social friction, Mark. And in the evening, I see, can I reframe it? So mm -hmm. therefore, anytime I'm getting triggered, it's a gift. I'm like, oh, amazing. I've been given an opportunity now to learn. Why have I got triggered? So instead of thinking the answer's out there, if that person behaved differently, so I know I'm in charge of my emotional response. I understand trauma plays a role here. I understand that many people have got unconscious trauma responses. I'm very well aware of that. But this is nonetheless something that can be worked on. It is a skill that people can get better at. And I promise you, just like if you say you're going to run a marathon in two years, you don't suddenly expect to go out tomorrow and run the full marathon. You know you have to practice and train and build up. It's the same thing with this. I've been doing this for about five years now. And most of the time, Mark, not all the time, most of the time in the moment, I can reframe it and look at the positive. So, you know, there's it's a really lot there, hard, but I'm very you, passionate I mean, I, about I, that. I feel like I've got almost to that point. Occasionally I have those moments of being insightful in the moment. I find I'm actually better at noticing afterwards and thinking, ah, yes, if only I could have reframed it. But that's great, there. Mark. That's great because but, but none of us are perfect. It's, it's baby steps on the journey, aren't they? So. Yeah, and, <laughs> and even that self-awareness piece later on at night, it's like, oh man, you know, I did get triggered out. I sent an email that possibly wasn't as well worded as I could have. That's great. Don't beat yourself and go, oh, mm. next time I'm going to try and do better. And it's also, if ever I am feeling I'm getting triggered a lot, it's also a sign for me to look what's going on. Oh, yeah, you know, you're not sleeping as much as you should at the moment. Maybe you've got too much work on. It's also, a, again, the whole message is happiness is an inside job. Yes, it's easier when certain things around us are going a certain way. I do not dispute that. But at its core, it's an inside job. Self-compassion is really important. But trying to look on the bright side, it doesn't mean... But, here's but the other thing, Mark. Also, sorry, sorry, go to, on, Mark. To interrupt, but just, I, I totally agree with all of that. But it, well, you've also, I think, shown us that it's a relational job insofar as how we relate with the world around us and the people around us as well. Because as you were talking about that sort of looking for friction, I was reminded of a, a sort of phrase mantra that I try to remind myself of, but for, again, find really hard. And it's simply choose being kind over being right, which is, you know, it's partly about my inner narrative, but it's also partly about empathy and seeing other people suffering and seeing the complicated situations that we're in. So I, I think it's really nice that you've reminded us of that it's inside, but it's also interconnected. It, it isn't, you know, kindness is a really um, big thing that I talk about that action for happiness, always try and promotes. Now, talking about this friction, right, and how you can reframe things, Another phrase that may be helpful for people is this. This phrase truly has changed my life. Whenever someone is doing something that I perhaps don't like or wish they were doing differently, and that is happening a little bit in my life at the moment in various aspects, the phrase I go to is, if I was that other person, I'd be doing exactly the same thing. Right, what does that phrase mean? That phrase means, if I was that person, with their childhood, with the trauma they experienced, with the bullying they had at school, with the parents they had, with the toxic first boss they had at 17, if I had had their life, almost certainly I would be thinking the same way as them and acting the same way as them. And it's so beautiful, Mark, because what it does, it takes the sting out of things and, and you start to lead with compassion. It doesn't mean that their behavior is acceptable. It doesn't mean that you need to put up with things and don't put up boundaries, but it means you understand that actually, if you were them, you'd be doing the same. And Mark, can I just briefly say, 
another episode on on my podcast which was truly life changing was one I had this a guy called John McAvoy, mm. right now. John McAvoy, uh, 10 years ago, right, John McAvoy was in Europe's highest security prison in Belmarsh. He was locked up with the 7-7 bombers. He was one of Britain's most, uh, uh, most wanted criminals, right? He's now free. He's now inspiring people all around the world. Um, for all his background, armed robbery, two counts of life, I would happily leave that man in my house looking after my two children. He's one of the nicest guys I've met. The first time I spoke to him on my podcast, Mark, I remember we finished two and a half hours going into his entire story. I said to my wife straight afterwards, I said, Mark, I said, babe, do you know what? If I had John's upbringing, I would be in jail right now with two life sentences, just like John. I was convinced once I heard his story, no male father figure, all the male figures in his life that he looked up to were criminals, were armed robbers, right? They treated women really well. They had their own moral conduct. Like he grew up with that. He ends up in jail until one night he sees on a jail television that his best friend has got killed in a, a car chase in Holland. And literally in that moment, he looked at his life and just thought, I've just been telling myself this BS story about it's us, the systems against us, we're fighting them. He literally woke up the next morning, chose a different story around his life. And within a few years, he's free. He's inspiring disadvantaged youngsters all around the world to get active. It's absolutely incredible. And I just want people to reflect, Mark, on that with hopefully, hopefully a powerful thought for them. What story are you currently telling yourself about your life? What prison are you keeping yourself locked in? What disempowering narrative are you currently taking in certain aspects of your life? And I'm not saying this to, to make anyone feel bad. I'm just offering a possibility that it's like, well, what would happen if I woke up tomorrow morning and decided to take a different perspective and choose a different narrative? What might happen then? Because that's all John did. That, I promise you, that is simply what changes life. He just realized, actually, from tomorrow, I'm going to choose a different story on my life. Rangan, so, we've been sorry. working with this amazing Action Happiness community and thousands of people for a decade now. And two stories I hear a lot, and I'm sure you've come across these. One of them is, it's amazing how often people who are incredibly kind to others have a very unkind voice to themselves. Uh, I certainly suffer with this myself, but people really aren't treating themselves like a friend in their head. And I think many people are shocked at how often that is, how common that is. Um, so that's one. And then another story is that somehow the world is wrong and it's other, everything is the fault of someone outside of myself. So there's one of them is about really, really hard on yourself. One of them is about sort of like feeling out of control. And of course, coming back to your stool, you know, you've either lost your sense of control or you've lost your sense of uh, contentment and inner peace. Are, are yeah. these things you see a lot in your patients? Yeah, 100 percent. And I've seen them in myself you know, and my patients, mm. which is why, you know, there's a chapter on self-compassion in the book, what we can do about it. Um, and this whole idea that we're talking about is, you know, here's the truth, Mark, right? If myself, you, or anyone watching this, if we think that our happiness is dependent on the world around us being a certain way and people around us acting in a certain way, well, we could be waiting a very long time, right? Because what we're effectively saying then is that happiness is outside our control. I can only be happy if people around me who I have no control over decide that they're going to behave with me in a certain way. That's how I lived much of my life. That's how my parents did. And I'm pretty sure I absorbed how they looked at life. That's how I then looked at life. And since I have woken up from that, and realize that it's actually a huge part of it's under my control, everything starts to change, right? And you can actually then start to positively influence the world around you when you're not feeling like a victim of life. Now, Mark, I get it. Some people have been through some horrific situations. I want to be respectful to that and mindful of that. I do understand, right? Some situations are horrible and incredibly challenging. I get that. So I'm not saying they're not. But I think for many of us, we have more control over our perspective than we think. And 
self-compassion, just very, very quickly, I want to say on self-compassion, if you call yourself a loser in your head, oh, you stupid thing, I can't believe you did that. Oh, you're such a loser. And again, I've done that for much of my life. Thankfully, I don't really do that much anymore. Or if I do, I catch myself. I go, no, no, let's not go down this path. We think that is neutral. It is not neutral. I spoke to Professor Kristen Neff on my podcast, one of the world's leading experts in self-compassion. And she has shown with her research that when you talk negatively to you in your head, to yourself, you activate your body stress response, right? So you are literally activating the cortisol response in your body when you call yourself a loser. It is not neutral, right? And here's the other thing, which I think is really important. If you won't do it for yourself, right? Please have a think about this for the sake of your children, because if your children watch you talk negatively to you all the time, right? What do you think they're going to pick up? And I say this with all of my heart, I promise. You know, one of the big um, drives for me to go on this journey after my dad died was I didn't want to pass this sort of negativity onto my own kids, right? That's a, the biggest thing I've learned in 12 years of being a parent, Mark, is that kids don't do what they, what you tell them to do. They do what they see you doing. And I very early on learned, hey, wrong, and if you don't like that behavior in your child, guess where they got it from. You can either look in the mirror and sort it out yourself, or you can unsuccessfully keep trying to tell them to alter something, right? So, that, and I say about self-compassion, I see that a lot, kids just repeating how their parents talk to themselves. So hopefully that might inspire people to go, it's no, really I've got to take this I, I, seriously. As a parent myself, I always remember that phrase, the way we speak to our children becomes their inner voice. And that's always something that- Oh man. Yeah. With me. It's, it's really, really hard, but you know, really inspiring stuff. Rungan, you mentioned stress recently, and I, and I, I want to get to those brilliant questions people are posting in the Q&A. And if you haven't had a chance to, and you'd like to add a question or vote on someone else's question, now's your chance to do it, because we're going to get there really soon. But Rungan, on the topic of stress, your previous book, you talked about a concept I think is so helpful about micro stress doses or MSDs, as you call them. The fact that it's perhaps not so much any individual stressor in our lives, but it's actually the kind of cumulative effect that can sometimes tip us from relative contentment into seriously unhappy ways of being. Can you say a bit more about that and particularly what we can do? Because I think lots of us have these everyday stresses all the time. Yeah, I think this absolutely plays into happiness. And, and I just want to set the stage here. Every single one of us has got what I call our own personal stress threshold, right? And let's say we wake up feeling totally calm and relaxed. I know that's not the case for everyone, but just for the, you know, for the point of getting this concept across, just imagine you do. So you wake up feeling calm and relaxed, and here's your personal stress threshold. Now, we accumul accumulate what I call MSDs or micro stress doses throughout the day. And what is a micro stress dose? A micro stress dose is a little hit of stress that in isolation, we can deal with just fine. But when they accumulate one after the other, after the other throughout the day, they get us closer and closer to our stress threshold. Now, here's the thing. When we get to that threshold, that's when things go wrong. That's when our back goes or our neck goes into spasm or we fall out with our partner or shout at our kids or send an email that we regret, right? It's when we've hit our stress threshold. And here's the mistake, Mark, we make. We often think it was the last thing that happened that was the problem. We think it was the email from our boss at 4 p.m. That, that was the problem. No, that wasn't the problem, right? The problem was you have basically been accumulating micro stress doses since the morning. And by the time that email came, you were right at your threshold. And so this is probably one of the most useful concepts I've ever come up with that I've, I've spoken about or written about. People stop me all the time. They find it so useful in their life because I make the example for people that a lot of people these days, they've accumulated 15 or 20 micro stress doses in the first hour of the morning, right? So let's say you're fast asleep. You went to bed too late the night before and your alarm goes off at 6.30 a.m., right? And it jolts you out of a deep sleep. That's micro stress dose number one. Then you look at your watch and go, oh, you know, I want a bit more sleep, right? So you put it on snooze. You fall asleep again. Six minutes later, it goes off, wakes you up. Micro stress dose number two. 
Then you look at your email inbox in bed on your phone. You go, oh man, there's three work emails um, that I didn't get back to. I need to do them now. Micro stress says number three. Then you go to your Instagram and find a negative comment. Then you go to um, the news website and see all the joy that the news is talking about at the moment. Clearly, it's not full of joy, right? The point I'm trying to make is, and so many people, Mark, in the chat are saying, oh my God, this is me. Oh my God, this is me, right? For many people, before they've even taken the duvet off and got out of bed, they're already on 10 micro stress doses. So what does that mean? That basically means they're starting the day with not much headroom. It will not take much in the day to tip them over. So there's many ways you can tackle that. You know, I don't know if we have time for that or not, but essentially... One of the ways is be very protective of the first 10, 20, 30 minutes of your morning so you're not accumulating all these unnecessary MSDs. There's also ways which I've written about that people can do in the day to help you know, reduce them. And yeah, you know, that's the concept basically, Mark. I'm aware of the time, so I want to make sure there's no, time for really questions. Helpful, but I, think just, I hope that helps being, people. Even being aware of this buildup and sort of almost back to this, I think it's been talked about as a stress bucket sometimes. Anything you could do to kind of yeah. release the tension out of the bucket helps you be further from that threshold. Um, I really want to come to some of these questions, Rangan. And in fact, I'm really pleased that the top one voted up at the moment is from Lisa, because I, I, I know in this community, there's a lot of people who, who care a lot for others and want to bring some of the great messages from your work to others that they care about. But it's, it's hard sometimes to help people who aren't switched on to the importance of happiness or find this hard to know how to help them. So Lisa's question is, I talked to my mum about this topic a lot. She su suffered with depression for many years. What she struggles with is knowing what will make her happy. She isn't able to list three things easily that will make her happy. Where do you start if this is how you feel? And I guess from Lisa's perspective, how do we help someone else who might be in that situation that we really care about? Yeah, Lisa, first of all, that's a great question. And this is a common theme that often comes up at any talks I give or any events, which is, yeah, Dr. Ashley, I get this, or I'm bought into these ideas, but my partner or my friend or my mother, basically someone close to me, they won't listen or I can't get them on board. And I've been asked this question many times over five or six years. And, you know, one of the hardest things to accept is that we can't actually change anyone else. It's, it, people are ready for change when they're ready for change and not a moment sooner. It's a very hard lesson to learn, right? But understanding that first of all is that we can't always change them, I think is very, very, I think it's, I think it takes the pressure off a little bit. And often people don't want to hear it from the people closest in their life, right? That's the, you know, you'll, you'll see this with partners or friends. We often, we'll often hear it. Look, I have this with my own wife and you know, things that I've been, I remember a few years ago, Mark, my wife said to me, um, hey, you know, I've been, I heard this guy talk about time restricted eating, you know, I think I'm going to try it. it's going to help me out, you know, what do you think? I'm like, you know, I've, I've written about this loads, I've spoken about it loads in my podcast, are you kidding me? But again, she doesn't want to hear it from me, right? She wants to hear it from someone who is not me. And I think that's human, right? That's the first thing. Second thing, in relation to what Lisa said about her mum, I think, if she doesn't know, uh, now I don't know your mum's situation, Lisa. I don't know how mobile she is, what's going on in her life. But for example, let's say she doesn't know what things are going to make her happy. And let's say one weekend you're out for a walk with her and she's having a bad day beforehand. At the end of that walk, what you could do is that, hey, mum, you know, how do you feel now compared to how you felt 30 minutes ago? Because once people start to draw the connection between oh yeah, I didn't feel great. I just want to stay at home, but you dragged me out. Man, I feel uplifted and energized because we've been outside for 30 minutes. You are just starting to seed in um, these ideas and you're drawing a connection with her that, oh, when I do this, I start to feel better. Okay, so that's one way you may want to tackle it. Uh, the, other, the other thing I'd say, um, and I could probably talk for an hour just on this answer, but the other thing I would say, and this is what I've had to learn in my own life, is that I think it's the Gandhi phrase that be the change you want to see in the world, right? I think the best way that we can change other people is to be that change, right? If you show up with your friends, with your family, with the people around you, calm, rarely getting triggered, 
always reframing to look on the bright side going, yeah, but you know what, maybe this is going on in their lives. Guess what they're going to be picking up. And so three components to that answer. I hope that they resonate in different ways for different people. But yeah, that, that's the way I would probably answer that question, Mark. I love that. And I, I'd add to that just that some of the questions we like to ask ourselves, I mean, I, every evening I end with what's been good today. I found a big shift when I stopped asking my kids, how was your day? And started asking my kids, what was good today? Just that little invitation to notice what's good, not just, oh, school's rubbish. You know, it, it's just we can slightly <laughs> change the way we interact with people, which I, but I love your advice on, on being the change. Um, Kimberly has asked a question back to your leg of the stool about alignment. Once you're out of alignment with yourself, how do you come back? So the example that Kimberly gives is, you know, let's say I did something that wasn't really who I was. Do I have to go back and make it right with the person first? So how do we realign ourselves? Yeah. That, again, Kimberly, thank you for your question. Really brilliant question. And there's, again, there's, depending on a situation, there's many different sort of components to that answer. The first thing is, I want to say, we often underestimate how important awareness is. So Kimberly, simply now, and maybe you're aware beforehand, but maybe something in this talk or this presentation, this conversation just made you think, oh man, yeah, I was out of alignment then. That's a huge change. Do not underestimate that. Simply being aware of this is, is the most important step because most of us are blind to what is going on. We're not conscious that we're doing these things, right? So don't underestimate that, number one. Number two, it's not necessarily a one hit, then you, you realize it and you can suddenly make amends. No, it may take a bit of time, right? There's a values exercise in the book, which is really, really uh, important to help you understand actually what are your core values? Because for many people, until we really identify and actually write down, this is who I am, it's very hard for us to actually then look at our life and go, yeah, I'm living in harmony with these values here. I'm living misaligned with the values there. So that will be very helpful. And, and yeah, to specifically answer your question, do you have to go and make amends? It kind of depends on the situation. It depends how you feel yourself. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to find that person. Maybe you can't get hold of that person. Maybe they're not there anymore. But what I would say you do have to do if you want to move through this and feel a deeper sense of happiness, and contentment, is be kind to yourself, right? Recognize that at that time, that was what you did. That was what you thought was the right thing. You were doing the best that you could at that time. And now with different information, you would, you would prefer to have made a different choice. That's okay. Be compassionate to yourself. Simply then going, next time I'm in this situation, um, I'm going to act differently. That's very powerful. And then if that person happens to be in your life and you know who it is and you can get hold of them, you know what? And I've done this myself. I've done it. I've recommended this to patients. You can say, hey, listen, you know, three years ago, um, I remember this happened and I did this. I'm really, really sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I've been thinking about it a lot. So I appreciate you were upset afterwards or this was the impact on you. But if you're going to go down that route, understand that you don't have, they don't have to forgive you in that moment. They can still be annoyed at you. That's still okay. You can't control their reaction, but simply you being honest with yourself, accepting it and doing something about it. That's where the power is. Maybe it'll take the other person five years to forgive you or one year, or maybe they'll never forgive you, but that, that's okay, right? That's up to them. If they choose to hold on to resentment and not forgive, that actually is going to eat them up inside, right? Because not being able to forgive, holding on to resentment, right? That is toxic for our health. In um, a previous book of mine, Feel Brush and Five, I shared an example of a lady with high blood pressure. And we made all the lifestyle changes that we could think of. Nothing would change. And I noticed this from the way she talked, she was holding on to resentment to her ex-husband who had cheated on her. Now, I understand why she was holding on to resentment, but I explained to her, there's a lot of research showing that inability to forgive, holding on to resentment is associated with all kinds of health problems, including high blood pressure. I taught her some forgiveness exercises over the course of three to six months. She uh, began that process of forgiving her ex-husband. That does not mean she was excusing her behavior, 
she was just letting go of the angst in her, her blood pressure came down, totally normalized with no medication. So I've got off on a few tangents there, Mark, from that one no, question. That's great but advice, wrong I, I think, uh, I think, yeah, you know, just being aware, don't underestimate that. So much of this comes back to our intention and our self-awareness and to some extent an acceptance of things that being outside our control, uh, genuinely outside our control. I mean, I, I was, I think of myself as a recovering people pleaser. I've always wanted to be liked. I've always wanted to be, you know, appreciated. And I, I take criticism quite badly and get quite defensive. And I've learned the hard way that if I'm expecting to always be thanked or never be criticized, I'm on a losing game. But if I can say, well, my intention here was good, however it was received, and that's all I can control. It's, it's really liberating. It kind of like takes the weight off my shoulders. Um, we're rapidly running out of time, Rogan. And there's two questions I'd just like to unite here. Yeah, please do. Um, Sarah said, how do we break the habit of negative thinking? That's a quite general thing about, you know, we get stuck in these spirals. Sky's made a really sort of um, personal point to do with anxiety, uh, but I think is, I think relevant for lots of us. So she said, um, how can I get out of a negative state when I feel suddenly triggered by something that comes up? So she gives the example of having health anxiety and talks about like a, a routine medical appointment, something I'm sure you're familiar with triggering anxiety. So whether it's our negative thinking generally or maybe something specific like a health anxiety, is there a way of shifting that state of mind? Yeah, look, these things, that there's multiple ways we can do this, right? But let's say in a particular moment, we are getting triggered, whether it's health anxiety or anything else, right? What does that mean? That means on some level, our stress response has been activated, right? So our nervous system is no longer calm. It's tuned up right? It's, it's set, it's high, it's become more highly strung, let's say, than it, than it would be if it's totally calm. Now, one idea I'm playing around a lot with, which I've started writing new content about, because I, I really like this as an idea, is that we see the world through the state of our nervous system. So wherever your nervous system is currently set, that's, that determines how you are going to see the world, right? So in that moment, when you're feeling triggered and your nervous system's turned right up, you are gonna feel anxious because that's what your stress response should do. You are gonna feel your vision and your focus come inward. You're not going to have perspective, right? You're not gonna be able to rashly think about things. So what can you do? First of all, noticing when that's happening is massive because if you can notice it, there's a few simple things like, like getting control of your breath in that moment will instantaneously change your state. And it's almost a cliche now about breathing, but the, it, it works and it is true, right? One of my favorite breaths is called the three, four, five breath. You breathe in for three, you hold for four, and you breathe out for five. Very simple, right? Anytime your out breath is longer than your in breath, you switch off your stress part of your nervous system and you promote the relaxation part. So a three, four, five breath or any slowing down of your breathing will help you feel less triggered, okay? So I know we haven't got long, so that's Let's just one- Let's do it now. I mean, we, we're slightly overrunning, but this is such powerful stuff. Could you just maybe talk us through one of those now? Could we do it together? Yeah, so guys, anyone who's who wants to give this a go, right? And I'll just count us through. Just wherever you're doing, you know, put your pens down, just sit down, uh, take a full breath out. And now breathe in for three, two, one. Hold for four, three, two, one, and now breathe out for five, four, three, two, one. Okay, now breathe normally. So people can just tune into how they feel now. Just one of those breaths, right? For most people, changes how they feel. You do five of them, it takes you one minute, you will completely change your physiology and your state. There is very, very good science on this. You know, I've spoken to all kinds of breathing experts on my podcast over the years who will, you know, people who are interested, they can listen to my conversation with James Nestor, Patrick McEwen, Andrew Huberman, you know, all kinds of people who are literally saying the same thing, right? So that is one thing people can do. There was also the first part of that question was negative self-talk right? Even being aware of it, I think it's important. But then I really like reflecting. So if you're having a day of negative self-talk, um, there is all kinds of things you can do, right? 
One thing you can do is in the evening, you can reflect and think, what was going on? What were the precipitating events? Did I not have a good night's sleep last night, right? Here's the thing a lot of people don't realize. If you sleep five hours a night compared to eight hours a night, your amygdala, which is the emotional part of your brain, can be up to 50% more reactive. You're going to be anxious. You're going to have negative thoughts. Your physiology will have changed. So it could just be simply, I need to prioritize my sleep tonight. Journaling can really, really help. A lot of the time we have negative self-talk because we haven't done anything to process the negative thoughts in our mind. We've gone straight into our emails or into our phone or the news, whatever. If you spend five minutes at the start of each day journaling, and this can take many forms. One form can be what I call free form, but just for five minutes, maybe with a cup of coffee or tea in the morning, you just write down anything, anything that comes in your mind. You will be amazed how much noise and junk that's in there. You literally and metaphorically are taking it out of your head and putting it onto paper. That can be very powerful. I've also created, created an exercise called the five-step release, right? So anyone who's got negative self-talk, anyone who feels anxious, um, and we can maybe send them a link to this tomorrow, Mark. So I think I've got it in a blog. It's in my third book, Feel Better in Five. But you just answer five simple questions. What's one thing I'm anxious about today? What's one thing I can do to prepare for it? What's one reason it probably won't be as bad as I think it's going to be? What's one reason... I know I can probably handle it. And five, what's one upside of the situation? Very simple, but so many people, Mark, contact me. I get DMs most days from people saying, oh my God, that five-step release exercise has totally reduced my anxiety. It, it, you bring it out of your head and put it onto paper. So all kinds of things there, Mark. You know, I, I, I honestly wish we had another two hours. I've got so uh, much I, I want to share well, with people. Again, but I'm, I'm really conscious of your precious time and also um, this community who I know we're expecting this to run um, until well, like, we've gone past our allocated time. And I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who's taken part in this. I've been very moved by what people have been sharing in the chat, the fantastic questions we've had. But Rangan, I've been you know, working in this area for a decade or more. And I can say, honestly, this has been one of the most engaging heartfelt and important conversations i feel that i've had with anyone oh. on this topic what you've done with this this whole area as well as your amazing background and your real insight is is really transformational life-changing stuff so on behalf of everyone thank you so much tomorrow we're going to share links to uh, all of your great work and where people can find out more but before we part i just wondered if you wanted to leave us with maybe a final thought to sort of draw all this together my final thoughts are as follows. Happiness really is a skill that all of us can develop and get better at. So no matter where you are in life right now, right? If you feel stressed and close to burnout, I am 100% sure that the tools that we've spoken about today, the tools in this book are going to help you. And if you're someone who actually feels, you know what? Yeah, life's okay. It's not bad, but could I be getting something more out of life? I think these same tools that we've spoken about that are in the book are going to help you as well. Happiness is not some mythical thing that will someday appear when things outside our control start to happen in a certain way. No, there's we can take control of our happiness. Happiness is an inside job. It's a skill. And that's why I've bust a gut really to break it down and simplify it and make it practical for people. Because I want people around me to be happy. I want everyone in the world to feel happier. And I know at the moment, a lot of people are struggling. A lot of people are struggling with the state of the world. But even amongst that, you can still feel happier than you currently are. And it's not as hard as you think. Well, again, that's a very wise, beautiful way to end this time together. Thank you so much all of you for being here and especially I'm going to you for your time and your wisdom. Keep up the great work. We'll be following closely and helping to continue to spread the word. Much appreciated. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Mark. And thanks to everyone who's joined. I hope you enjoy your day wherever you are. So take care. Thank you. Thank you all.